Thank you. Mr. Piplinski, what is your not ready announcement based on? Based on the fact that I think it is not practical to go forward today, and I will explain that. What we are set for today is a merits hearing as to mom only. Both of the fathers in this case have jury demands on file. Um, what will happen, and I just don't see the urgency in terminating one parent only today and leaving the rest of the case in way. And I'll explain what's going to happen is at the very best, we're going to end up with an interlocutory order, presuming termination is granted. That won't become final until the father's positions are resolved. So it doesn't make any sense in my eyes to hear that for a judge or a jury, the fact finder, to hear the facts of this case twice. The, the other, I think, and that's particularly uh, compelling given the fact that it's my understanding that the children don't want mom's rights terminated, that the fathers don't want rights terminated. And I, and I would propose or submit this, what happens if we are inclined, you are inclined to terminate mom today, we get to a jury trial, and what if that jury decides to reunify these kids with their father? I think that there's a possibility that jury may be inclined to, if reunification with a father is achieved, to want to have the ability to name mom as a possessory and give her limited rights, duties, and responsibilities to these kids, that they would be foreclosed and barred from doing so. And you know, it's going to be essentially the same evidence that we're hearing today that this jury is going to be hearing a month or two down the road from now. We are just outside of the nine month mark. This case was filed in April of last year. We're just at the nine month mark. Um, I, I just don't see, and you add in the fact that the children are currently in a foster, straight foster home. It's not a foster to adopt. The department does not have a permanent solution in mind for these kids, even if termination on the fathers is achieved. They've got nowhere to place these kids. So for a practical reason, it just doesn't make sense to me to only address mom today and foreclose the jury's ability down the road should they seek to reunify these kids with the father to foreclose the jury from giving them the option to do something with the mother. Um, and that's going to happen within the next month or two anyway. So when is your jury these, setting? When is your jury setting? I, you yeah. have to, I, the fathers will have to respond to that. I, I don't, we don't know. currently have a jury setting for them. And to Mr. Poplinski's issue here, uh, the jury doesn't have that option because the mom signed a rule 11 that gave up the option of putting anything about her rights before a jury. And to even make the suggestion that the jury should be able to make this decision is completely inappropriate. Um, saying that her interlocutor, if we do today an interlocutor, it would be an interlocutory order that wouldn't be final. It would be the exact same situation if we went to a jury trial where the dads would be held first and their, uh, their decision would be an interlocutory that would not then be final until we dealt with mom. So we're we're just trying to delay the inevitable here. Quite honestly, it just feels like a delay tactic by mom, which makes sense because we've been delaying this since the beginning. She entered into a Rule 11 agreement back in June uh, based on an aggravated circumstances, uh, find, not finding, but she agreed that she um, subjected the kids to aggravated circumstances. She agreed that her trial on the merits would be, would be set on an accelerated timeline. And if she was doing what she was supposed to do, then we would be looking at resetting it on a normal trial uh, timeline. However, she didn't hold up her end of the bargain. And so here we are. Um, the department is ready to proceed today on this case regarding mother's parental rights. And I don't think as a practical matter is a basis for kicking this down the road. It is not unusual that we deal with one parent and then we deal with the other. That happens all the time where we terminate one and then we move on to another parent down the road because that is just something that happens in these cases. Um, you know, and then if the jury decides to reunite with the fathers, that's their prerogative, but that's not an option today for mom. And if I may respond, Jenner, I mean, I'm looking at the Rule 11 agreement. Can, can you share the Rule 11 on the screen? Can someone share it? I've got it, Your Honor. Thank you. And, and this is not mom's attempt to do so. This is me just trying to be practical and have judicial economy, given that thing is coming right around the corner anyway. But well, she apparently they don't have a jury setting for the fathers. They need to get that, though, because you're running out of time. 
Yes. Okay. So hang on. Let me, let me, let me yes, read this, okay? Yes, There's a stipulation that if mother is in good standing, fully engaged in her services, uh, in, on, the, on her plan of service and ordered by, as ordered by the court and has complied with and is clean on all drug screens requested of her, then the department agrees to reset the trial on the normal timeline. Uh, does that stipulation kick in? No, Your Honor. Okay, would you move the screen down and move it down a little bit on the screen so I can read some more? Yes, Judge. Okay. Can I see the signatures if you don't mind? I guess there's another page. Well, there's two two more pages there. And I believe the last page is just the service document, Your Honor. Okay. Yeah, that's what that is. Mr. Kaplinski, uh, your not ready announcement is overruled. We'll proceed. Ms. Howes, call your first witness. Uh, yes, Your Honor. We'd start with Dr. Robin Heineman. Say that one more time. Uh, department's first witness will be Robin Heineman. Ms. Heineman, okay. Uh, everyone else, if you don't mind, if you're not an attorney, keep your device muted. Uh, Ms. Heineman, uh, are you in a position where you have some privacy? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Okay, very good. Uh, you may proceed. Good morning, Ms. Heineman. If you could please introduce yourself and spell your last name for the record. Oh, good morning. It is Robin, R-O-B-I-N, last name Heineman, H-E-I-N-E-M-A-N-N. -E and I am the foster mother to Memphis and Lennox Asharte Rushford. Okay. And Ms. Heineman, how long have the girls been placed with you? Um, they were placed in my home on June 23rd, 2022. Okay. And how old are the children? Um, currently, Memphis is three, Lennox is five. And have they had birthdays since they've been with you? Yes, they did. Uh, Lennox in August and Memphis, uh, she had hers in November. Okay, so they were two and four when they were placed with you? Yes. Okay. And tell me, how are the girls doing in your home that you can see? I think they're doing well. Um, they're very bonded to each other. Um, I, I think that they are back to being, uh, you know, kids and um, Lennox is in school. Uh, she's had some struggles, but we're getting there and we're working with the school and she's doing well. Um, Memphis is with me and um, she's doing excellent. Um, how is that, if it is at all, any different from when the girls first came into your home? When they first arrived, of course, most foster, you know, they, they were scared, but, and um, I think shut down um, in a way that um, they weren't very open. Uh, they were very, as I say, bonded to one another. Lennox was very parental towards her uh, younger sister. Um, and um, I think with Lennox going off to school during the summertime, I worked really hard with Memphis to kind of, be have more autonomy and I knew that they would have a separation um, issue because they were so bonded. I saw that as I uh, worked with them to do independent play and things like that, more age appropriate with each other. And I think Lennox um, just naturally was very maternal. Uh, she's a very sweet, soft uh, child that looks after her sister very well. Memphis has the stronger personality and so, um, uh, but I think they're doing well now. Before, when they first came, um, there was medical issues. It, it presented itself in the first day. Um, they were both in pull-ups. And um, so Lennox came to me at four years old in pull-ups that was defecating on herself hourly. And I couldn't understand it. And I was very concerned. I called uh, my pediatrician that I use and they were able to do a telehealth and they were able to get me an appointment. Uh, it, they came in my home on Thursday. By Friday, I was concerned uh, because Lennox was having something that I just couldn't identify. She was having maybe prolapse with her anus or something of that nature. It turned out to be encopresis, chronic uh, constipation. 
And we, we went to the doctor 8 a.m. that following uh, Monday. Um, and she's been in um, incopresis therapy. She still has trouble with incopresis and enuresis daily, but that has improved dramatically. But when she did first come to my home, that was my first worry issue. Um, and so that was um, helped by the pediatricians. And then the next issue was she cried a lot at Lennox, I'm speaking of. She cried when she would eat. Um, I could tell that she wanted to eat. And at first I thought maybe she just wasn't used to the foods that I was making. But when I would give her a treat, she would start to eat it and cry. And that also was one of the reasons I quickly sought out the, the pediatrician. And they discovered that she had- And I'm going to object to hearsay. Okay. And I- okay, Hang on just a second. Hang on just a second, Ms. Heinemann. Yes. Your objection is to- uh, Hearsay as to what the pediatrician said. Okay. I'll sustain that. Go ahead. But don't tell me what the pediatrician said, Ms. Heinemann, okay? Yes, Your Honor. Um, she was having difficulty eating and crying. And of course, that made me very concerned. Um, Lennox was, uh, you know, it took time to gain her trust to look in her mouth and it appeared she might have a cracked molar. I took her to the dentist. Um, they did indeed confirm she had six. And I'm gonna object to hearsay from the dentist as well. I'll sustain that. Don't tell me what the dentist told you. Okay, she was treated for six cavities and um, a cracked tooth. And they said they said she had a lip tie. And I'm gonna object yeah. to hearsay. Okay. Okay. You can't tell me there what was the a, dentist said. Okay. All right. Let me let me ask this a different way, Ms. Heineman. Um, regarding uh, Lennox, you looked in her mouth, and just by looking, were you visually able to see what you believed were issues? Yes. And did you take her to a dentist to address any potential dental issues? I did. Um, did she just end up needing to go to the dentist one time, or were there multiple appointments? It was it was multiple appointments. And after though, how many appointments would you say? Of a total of four. Okay. And after those four appointments, did the issues you were seeing, like the crying during eating, did that appear to be resolved? Yes, it did. Okay. Um, when she was crying during eating, did she look like she was in pain? Did she not want to eat? Can you describe what that looked like? Yes. She would take a bite and begin to cry. Um, and I'd ask her, what's wrong? And she couldn't voice it. And then she she began to uh, be able to tell me um, that it hurt to eat, that she didn't like that. And like I say, it took a little bit for me to learn because I thought she didn't like the food. But as I moved to softer food, uh, that worked. Today, uh, and it's been, I guess, uh, six, seven months now, approximately, since they've been in your home, is she able to eat any food freely? Yes, she eats freely and um, enjoys, you know, like what any five-year-old child, crunchy foods, soft foods, treats without any pain. Okay. Um, did you, was she underweight when you got her by your perception? I would say yes. Since she's been with you, has she gained weight? She has. Okay. Is she overweight? No, she's not. So no concerns about that? No. Okay. Um, regarding the pull-ups, and that was uh, Lennox as well, is that correct? Yes. Okay. How is she doing as far as potty training goes? Um, she's done well, but she still uh, has daily accidents. Um, and um, I want to preface she's made a lot of progress because um, We've been through this the the therapy in the sense that um, she has she's very comfortable um, when she has that accident she doesn't prompt herself to go change and so it's more of a, a external person saying oh no you know uh, we we better go change and so she's she is learning she's getting it um, um, I know at school it's been uh, an embarrassment for her. We've worked on it, but she is 100% in panties. She just tends to 
um, have an accident when she's more excited now or she's just um, not near a bathroom. So we, we work with that. Mm -hmm. um, Memphis right now is 100% potty trained. Okay, great. And she, was she when she came to you? No, neither child was. Okay. Um, have you had difficulty? I mean, I know Linux has the medical issues, but any difficulty with potty training Memphis or is that a smooth transition? I, I would say there was a smooth transition until she decided, you know, like three year old, two year olds do. It, it was a young two year old and I didn't pressure Memphis to be potty trained. She wanted to. She saw her older sister going through it and she decided she wanted panties. She wanted to be like her big sister. And so I just went along with it because that's what Memphis was asking. I didn't um, I was more interested in prepping Linux. Um, and helping her. And so Memphis was there, of course, and seeing it. And so in, in essence, yes, she she picked, she went into potty training very easily and, and you know, took to it very quickly. That's great. Um, do you currently, other than, you know, Linux and the, the issues, uh, digestive issues, um, any further medical concerns that you've seen since the kids have been with you? Um, no. Okay. Um, how about any cognitive delays or concerns when they first came to you? Um, yes, I was concerned that um, they didn't know their letters. Um, maybe that might, um, you know, simple words. I had a little trouble understanding Memphis at first, uh, but Lennox could understand her. And so we worked a lot on phonics. We worked on letters and numbers counting. Um, I would say that Lennox was very good with numbers, but some of her pronunciation, um, she didn't know her name started with an L, um, things like that. And so we began to work on um, where a four-year-old sh should be in prepping her for um, kindergarten. Okay. And how has that progressed? She's done well. She does struggle in school because um, the teacher's feedback is that- Objection, uh, hearsay. Don't tell me what the um, teacher said, not sustain them. Um, I have been um, asked to come into school to help her um, and to do additional work with her uh, to bring her up to target. She is not um, on target in her class at this time. Is she making improvements? She is. Okay. And, and how about uh, Memphis with learning letters and, and her basic phonics? How is that going? It's going well. I would say she's she's doing well with that. Um, it does take, I would say it, it is taking extra time. Um, she loves, you know, singing songs and things like that. Um, when it comes to schoolwork, um, sometimes, you know, children, uh, uh, they gravitate towards what they like the best. Sure. Um, are you willing to continue working with the girls on these issues the the yeah. okay. absolutely okay. thank you um so we talked about the girls having a really strong bond to one another um have what is their relationship like with you you indicated at the beginning that there was some trust building can you describe what your relationship is like with Memphis today and then we'll move on to Linux uh, yes yeah. I think it's good I think that they uh, um trust me and definitely are um, responding as kids that feel uh, safe and happy. Okay. Why do you say that? Because when they came to me, they were very uh, shut down. When I spoke to especially Lennox directly, she would immediately cry instead of, and, and it wasn't raising a voice or any of that. It was just speaking to a child um, and asking a question. She had a lot of trouble answering without just immediate crying. Um, and her, uh, she didn't, she didn't talk a lot. Uh, have you seen a change in that respect with Linux? Yes. Can you describe that? Um, she's more open. She'll uh, talk about her day. She talks about making friends. She's excited when she plays. She's able to do independent play um, well. Uh, we did a lot of socialization. She still has trouble with that. Um, she prefers being on her own versus uh, in, you know, taking on um, a social group. So we work together um, 
you know, introducing her to children that are her age. Um, she's very good with Memphis, as I said before, um, but she's kind of separating out. She's at an age where she wants to do more of her things and less of what uh, her younger sister likes to do. Um, so uh, there's natural, what I see as a good sign is the natural sibling um, interaction. It's, it's healthier, less parental. Okay. And uh, as far as let's just talk about the physical contact, hugging in the home, is that do the girls give you hugs? Yes. Okay. Um, there's been some discussion. Pardon? They're very affectionate now. Okay. Um, and you said we, is that your husband or partner that you have at home? No, it's just myself. Okay. Um, now, Ms. Heineman, there's been some discussion. I believe you've heard it this morning that you are not a foster to adopt home. Is that accurate? It is. It is. Okay. What is your plan for the girls moving forward should parental rights be terminated? Objections to the relevance if she's not a long-term solution. Well, I'm, I'm asking her what she would be willing to, to do. I don't I haven't heard from testimony that she's not a long-term solution. I believe that came from a lawyer. Uh, so um, I'll allow her to answer the question. Um, I guess I'm committed to the girls. If uh, as a foster parent, I would continue to look after them, and of course, uh, advocate for whatever is best for them. Okay. Um, if that took years, would you be willing to get a long-term foster placement for them? Mm, I I would say I would want permanency for them. Um, that is the 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 hope for them. Uh, but yes, I would be willing. Okay. Uh, Ms. Heineman, is there anything about Memphis or Lennox that I haven't asked you that you, is pressing on your heart and your mind? Object to the form of the question, open ended, calls for Over, overruled. You can answer the question if you if you can. Um, I would say these are really, really well-behaved girls. Um, I'm going to say that they, they've been through a lot. They do disclose things. Um, and, but I think right now they're, they feel uh, their concentration is on playing, on school, on learning. Um, they've, uh, they've adapted very well, I think. Ms. Heineman, thank you so much for your time and uh, taking care of these girls. I have no other questions at this time, Your Honor. Mr. Piplinski? Yes. Uh, Ms. Heineman, I mean, just so that we can be clear, um, as we stand here today, are you a straight foster or foster to adopt? Um, I, um, my agency has me at foster to adopt because when I started this journey, I was much younger and that has been uh, how they classified me. But I did inform them uh, prior to this placement uh, that I am uh, uh, just interested at this time, foster. Okay. All right, nothing further. Thank you, Judge. You're welcome. Mr. McCormick? No questions. Mr. Hardy? Yes. Um, how long have you been a foster placement? Um, since 2016. Okay, so for a few years. Um, in your experience, is it unusual at all for kids to be a little reserved when they are placed with you? No. Okay. So nothing about their behavior and being reserved at first and opening up later, none of that was unusual? Um, the amount of crying was unusual. But the reservedness was not unusual, correct? I'm not sure how to answer that because usually children tell you a lot about their home life. They'll say, my mommy does it this way, my daddy does it this way, or however their caregiver. These children, I would say, were more um, like Memphis would begin to talk and Lennox would correct her and say, we don't talk about that. Okay. And so that, that seemed uh, out of character for foster children. Okay. Um, do the kids seem to want to be returned to their parents? 
uh, they talk about their family. Um, I want to say, honestly, Memphis has said to me, I want to stay here. But they do talk about their parents living with me, living here with together. Uh, they talk about their Ga and their Gigi. They talk about um, Knox. And it's more of, um, they don't really talk about a home. They just talk about their family. They miss okay. their family. So they do still want to have a relationship with their family. I would say yes. Okay. Um, how much weight has Lennox gained in the time that she's been with you? Um, four pounds. Okay. So she was about, so she was just a little bit under, under average. Correct. When she, okay. Um, no further questions. Ms. Smith, any questions for Ms. Heinemann? Yes, Judge. Um, good morning, Ms. Heinemann. Good morning. And Ms. Heinemann, um, you indicated that both Lennox and Memphis have had birthdays um, since they have come to live with you, correct? Correct. And what um, calls or gifts or birthday arrangements um, were made by the parents, um, you know, for the girls? Um, uh, nothing as far as... Um, with me um there was no arrangements for birthday uh there wasn't any gifts that i knew came from the mother or father were there any birthday cards or a call to the to the girls uh, there was um during a zoom call that was a visitation there was uh the mother did wish uh her children happy birthday she wished um her, uh it was a lennox uh, happy birthday and was that the day of the birthday or how soon or far from the birthday was that? It was before the birthday. Okay. Um, but no calls or, or anything, the department never shared with you any gifts or anything that came from the parents? Um, okay. okay, no, no. Okay, okay. And um, So you also talked about um, the attachment. Um, is it fair to say that the only attachment the children showed when they came to you was an attachment to each other? Yes, that's a fair assessment. Okay. And in your communication with them, um, did they indicate an attachment to anybody else? It was confusing to me at first, but I would say at first they spoke about their sister, Mia. Of course, I um, I discovered who that was later. They they spoke of Mia, and but they didn't tell me it was her sister. Um, and then they also talked about Noxie. And so I thought those were, um, I didn't know who they were. And when I would ask, um, it was Memphis who told me who they were. Okay. And just revisiting the birthday, is it fair to say that it was actually um, one of the siblings who made the birthday, who made the call so mom could say happy birthday? Yes, I believe it was Mia. Okay, so it wasn't mom on her own who actually made the call or it wasn't a visit. It was a sibling who made, who induced mom to call. Objection, relevance, call for speculation. Well, Your Honor, it's relevant because... Um, the, the parents have shown no initiative with respect to these children, in fact, may have even abandoned these children. So I think it's- I right. understand, but this is a speculation uh, I'm gonna sustain, it's just speculation. Well, do you, know who may, do you know whether or not it was mom's visit or was it someone who made a call so mom could wish her happy birthday? From my information, it was um, made uh, by someone else. It was made by um, okay. the okay. objection. Thank you. And so um, are you aware that Memphis actually called Lennox mommy for the longest time after, she, after when they came to live with you? Yes, she did. Did you find that to be unusual? Yes. And um, in turn, um, did you find Lennox to be particularly maternal towards Memphis? Yes. 
So she acted in the role as mommy. Yes. And is it fair to say that when Memphis needed um, anything, whether it was being sued, et cetera, in the first um, stages of being with you, she turned to Lennox for that? Um, Memphis did, yes. Memphis turned to Lennox for soothing, called her mommy. Okay. And um, is it fair to say that in the beginning when the kids came to you, they, in fact, mentioned their parents a lot? No, um, they didn't. They mentioned Ga, Gigi, Noxie. And is it fair to say that they mentioned them even less now? Yes. Okay. With respect to the... Um, and Caprices, have were you were you did you have to do your own um you know information gathering as to what in Caprices was and how it affected a child and what caused you know the causes of in Caprices? Objection. Right? I'm gonna object also. I'm gonna object also to that. I'm going to sustain that. When uh, is it fair to say that when well are you aware that um, this was something that was taking place before the child came to live with you? No. Do you know whether or not this was something that happened only when she came to live with you or before she had been living with you? Um, when I met the family on the first visitation. They indicated objection. Uh, Calls for hearsay. All right, sustain that. Now, has has are any of the children lactose intolerant? No. And do they eat whatever you give them to eat? Yes. With no problems at all. And no issues. Okay. And with respect to Lennox's um tooth or tooth issues, have those cleared up? Yeah, they have. Does she cry anymore when she um, has to eat? No, she does not. Okay. And has her has the lip tie been taken care of? No, um, it hasn't. Do you know why? It was, um, uh, they said that because of the... Surgery, I'm going to object to hearsay. All right. Sustain. Don't, don't tell me what the doctors told you. Um, as she matures, um, they're waiting to see how it develops. And that surgery is pretty serious. Um, and so it was recommended um, to wait and monitor and see, um, but mainly uh, to help her, um, um, you know, work around it. I understand. And since the children have, well, have you had the opportunity Ms. Heinemann, to have observed any um, Zoom calls between the mother and the children? Yes. And um, what did you observe? Um, it, they're normal in that they are happy to talk with their mother. I did notice that as time, I would say the last Zoom meeting, they turned away. They did not engage with their mother um, very much. Um, but, you know, she makes a good effort, um, but I did notice that the children did not seem to interact with her, uh, engage with her, like, um, they just, they, like I say, they actually turned their back to the screen, uh, seemed to be more interested elsewhere. Was there a Zoom call in which the mother cried and the girls had to comfort her? Yes. And, um... Can you tell the court about that? Um, yes, the first call, um, I wasn't sure um, at first, but then I realized the mother was crying and, and the girls were comforting and saying, telling their mother um, that it's okay. The mother did ask, saying that how, she asked Lennox how was her heart, um, Lennox, um, didn't seem to know how to answer. Um, and then after the call, um, 
Yeah. Linux was very emotional. Okay. Um, since the girls have been with you, how many visits has the mother had? Two, I believe. Two. Do you recall when those visits were? The very first visitation was, um, I'm sorry, I have to go back to my, it's been a, it's been a long time. Um, the, I do remember the first visitation uh, that was scheduled. That one was um, with the mother uh, in Lambda Park. Um, and then there was um, a second visit. There's been two with the mother that I know of. Were there any canceled visits? Yes, um, yes, several canceled visits. Um, it, she, she, we had what regular weekly um, or biweekly visitation, and um, those were all canceled. Do you know? Did you cancel those visits? No, I did not. And are, do you know whether it was the mother who canceled those visits? Um, I believe she was a no-show. So because she was a no-show, the department had to cancel the visits? Correct. And do you recall approximately how many of those visits were no-shows? I was going to say all of them. Except for the first two visits? Well, the, it was the first visit. And then immediately after that, the next visit was a no-show. The, the grandmother wanted to, uh, she, she showed. And the sister, that's how I met um, Mia. Um, it was the grandmother and the, the sister that showed. In, and it was a no-show on um, the mother's part. So your understanding is that the mother has had only one visit with her, with the children? She had one visit that was the first scheduled visit. After that, there were no other visits from the mother until um, uh, it was after a court, uh, after we went to court, uh, the mother proceeded again to pick up her visit. Um, and we had one after that, and then there were no more visits. Um, okay. No, there were no show visits after that. Okay. So it was your understanding that after that, the second batch of go round of visits, mom had a visit, and then there were no shows after that. Correct. Okay. I'll be very brief. Ms. Einring, good morning. Uh, good morning. I am Knox's attorney. Uh, could you describe for the court what your personal knowledge is of any interactions between Knox and the two little ones? Uh, yes. Um, I um, understand that Knox, uh, uh, I met Knox with his grandmother during a visit with his grandmother and his great grandmother. And can you describe the frequency in which Knox and the two little ones have interacted over the course of them being with you? Um, I believe Knox has been in three visitations that have been with the grandmother um, and great-grandmother. Does it appear that all of the children enjoy those interactions? Uh, yes. I'm sorry, you kind of broke up. You, you said yes? Yes. Okay. Um, one last question. Um, either parents describe the uh, incaprices to you? No. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. Anyone else have anything else for Ms. Heinemann? Mr. Piplinski. Thank you. Ms. Heinemann, now these children were, were four and two when they were placed with you? Correct. And that was in June of 2022? Correct. Did you have any prior relationship with these kiddos before they were placed with you? No. Have you fostered children before these two were placed with you? Yes, sir. Do you find it unusual that two little girls, four and two years old, placed in a stranger's home were turned to each other for love and affection as these are the only familiar faces they know in a strange person's home? I know. Okay, so when we talk about being parentified in Memphis turning to Lennox, do you find that unusual under these circumstances? The amount, yes. Okay. Now, you, you, you talked also a lot about a lot of mom's no-shows. Are you aware that given they were placed with you in June, that in October, both the department and the court cut off mom's visits? 
my agency informed me that because mom was a no-show and that well, that's a yes or a no okay. question okay. are you aware that in october the department discontinued mom's visit per a court order in october i was aware informed, of that? i was informed by my agency at some point when i did ask what is going on so that's uh, a yes you, you know that as we picture today you are aware of that yes i am okay so you're not blaming mother for no shows of any visitation that took place after the, that decision by the department was made in October. Fair no, sir, we, no uh, she had scheduled visitations. She had scheduled phone calls. We were waiting for them, and then I would they wouldn't go through. She okay. didn't show up on those. No, not I'll pass the witness, Your Honor. Anyone else have anything else for Ms. Heineman? I just want to clear up that last bit, Your Honor. Go ahead. Okay, Ms. Heineman, can you please explain the no shows? What you mean by that? There would be a scheduled visitation or a scheduled phone call Zoom for the mother. There was also, I understood, visitations available to the father that I would have to make myself available to go to the location and make sure that I made those scheduled visits and also Zoom calls. With the mother, uh, she did have those. We did meet them. And there were instances where um, the children were expecting it and I was expecting it and it did not follow through. And then after that, I did learn from um, my agency that they had been, the, uh, those had been terminated because of the no-show. And it had come from a judge's order. With the father, I, I understand. I, I want to stop you there because we. I just want to focus on mom today. Okay. Um, so prior to this October timeframe, were there visits and phone calls that mom failed to appear for? Yes. Okay, approximately how many going back she had two she had before that uh, before i was informed about the um from the agency she had one physical visit and one uh, and two zoom calls and then it was no show after that and that's uh there were from what i understand there were two uh no shows and then i was informed by my agency um, that the court order said um, there would be no visitations because she had not um, kept those appointments. Okay. Um, did mom ever call you letting you know <laughs> that she wasn't going to be on a visit? No. Okay. And did you make yourself and the girls available for all scheduled visits? Yes. Okay. And how long would the girls have to wait around before you know, waiting on mom to show up before you ended up moving on to something else? Uh, we would wait about 25 minutes. The customary time frame is usually 15 minutes, but we would give, you know, um, I think the first visit we waited 30 minutes. Sorry, Miss Mendez, can you give me a minute? Um, the first visit we waited the whole visit, um, the the physical visit and mom never did show, but the uh, I was told, anyway, we expected her to show during the visit, but it, there was no show. And so we did wait the entire two hours, um, hoping. And then, I'm sorry, I'm careful. I'm sorry, I have a visitor. Um, <laughs> <sorry. laughs> Give me a moment, please. <laughs> I'll be right here. Thank you. Um, and then during the Zoom call, we would just wait. We would just hope that, you know, um, the phone call would come. And, uh, uh, but we would go on. I'm going to object to the narrative, minutes. Your Honor. The question's been answered. I'm going to sustain that. Thank you, Ms. Hyman. Just for the record, was that little Linux that came in and wanted a piggyback ride? No, that was Memphis. Oh, I'm sorry, Memphis. Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, no other questions, Your Honor. Anything else from anyone else? Um, Mr. Just Hardy? Have Linux and Memphis been given any visits with their half siblings um, on the paternal side? Um, no, um, nothing's been arranged on the paternal side. Okay, thank you. No further questions. Okay, um, thank you, Ms. Heineman. You're free to stay. You're free to go, whichever you prefer. Uh, Ms. Howell, who's your next witness? Sorry, Ms. I didn't realize I was muted. Uh, Sarah Cardwell. And your honor, this time we can release uh, Gary Ebert. Uh, I'm not sure that we'll get to Sergeant Ebert, and I'm still undecided on his necess necessity for testimony at this point. Okay, so I he says he's custodian of records or right. some jail records. Okay. 
We're sorry, uh, Sergeant Ebert. If you're needed at a later date, Ms. Howes will reissue the subpoena for you. Sorry for taking up your morning. You're free to go. And Ms. Cardwell, how are you employed? I work for uh, the Department of Family and Protective Services. What county do you work with? Uh, Hayes County. Okay. And what is your role? I'm a family-based caseworker. How are you associated with Marisha, Marissa Acharte and the children, Lennox, Memphis, and Knox? The case was assigned to me from investigations. Okay. And I want to walk through that with you. Uh, when did you first get a case involving these children? The case was assigned to us on the 27th of January, 20, 2022. Um, we officially accepted the case February 4th, 2022. Okay. And as a family-based caseworker, what are the first steps that you do in order to uh, make yourself ready to help out a family? Um, when we get a new case assigned to us, we get 10 days to complete a joint assessment with the investigator, um, with the family, and then we do assessment. We, we utilize the assessment to determine what services are necessary for the family. Um, and if the case is appropriate, it transfers officially to FBSS. And at that point, um, we, based off the information from the family, we determine the services. Okay. And when you got the case, you went over, did you take those steps? Yes. Okay. And when you're familiarizing yourself and trying to figure out what you need to know, what were your concerns with, and we'll just specifically speak to Mrs. Charte, what were your concerns with her? Okay. Um, we had concerns regarding um, drug use, methamphetamine specifically. Um, during our assessment, Mrs. Charte informed me that two years prior, she went to accountability court and she did a year-long program. Um, she had a stable house, a full-time job at that time. The kids all expressed being happy. Um, maternal grandmother and the oldest child, Mia, they all denied seeing signs of her abusing any drugs or anything. Um, they all confirmed that she didn't relapse. Um, we were concerned because she just had a removal in 2017 to 2018. Um, we didn't have any new intakes. Um, the intakes that did come in, they weren't found to be true. So when we officially accepted the case, we thought it would be best to follow up with the providers collaterals to confirm mom's behavioral changes. Um, we did think that further investigation was necessary, um, which is why we accepted the case at that point. Um, but due to it being four years since the removal, um, we wanted to give mom a chance to prove whether or not she was actively um, using meth. So we were going to send her for a hair follicle, um, have a protective conversation with her and her support systems about not reverting back, have an inappropriate company because she was pulled over. Her story to us was that she was in the car with a friend who she was transporting to get meth to use for gas money. Um, and so we just wanted to see if she was actively using and teach her to make better decisions. Okay. Um, so I want to back up and unpack that a little bit. Okay. So you had a conversation with Ms. Acharte about the allegations that led to her being involved with family base. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And do you recall when that conversation took place? It's February 3rd. Okay. Um, and when you were speaking with Mrs. Charte on February 3rd, did you confront her with the allegations in, in the present case? Yes. Can you explain what you said to Mrs. Charte? Um, we spoke about what actually happened that day. Um, I wanted to get her opinion on it based off of what was reported. And at that time, she informed me that um, she was not abusing meth, that her friend offered to give her gas money if she would go and pick up the friend um, and transport them to the house where the meth was uh, located at um, so they could buy the meth. She okay. said she denied using anything at that time. Okay. And so your response to this concern was to have her take a drug test. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. And when did you first ask Ms. Acharte to take a drug test? She was sent February 7th. Okay. And did you follow up with Mrs. Charte to see if she went and took that hair follicle test on February 7th? Yes. Okay. And did she? Yes, she completed the test. Were you able to collect results from that test? Yes. Um, the UA came back. Objection. Negative. Objection. Uh, hearsay. Uh, you might be able to finish your sentence, Ms. Cardwell, but finish it without saying what the results were or anything that you read on the results page. Okay. Can you ask me the question again, Ms. House? Yeah. So I can rephrase you, you indicated that you asked Ms. Acharte to take a hair follicle test on February 7th. Yes. Did she complete the hair follicle test? Yes. Okay. Were there, without going into the results, were there any issues with that hair follicle test or were you able to obtain results from that hair follicle test? 
the hair follicle was found invalid. <laughs> Sorry. Well, the hair follicle, it was not active. We couldn't get results from the hair follicle. Okay. Now, as a result of being able to or unable to get any sort of specimen or results for Mrs. Charte, what did you do? We sent her for another hair follicle. Okay. Do you recall when you sent her for a second hair follicle? We discussed it February 15th that she would complete another one. Um, at that time, she said she would speak with her attorney to see if she should complete the test. So I met with her again February 24th um, to discuss doing another test, but she canceled because the kids were sick. Um, on March 2nd, I met with her at that time and told her that I need her to complete the test. She told me her attorney advised her not to. Um, and so I informed her that I would have to staff for legal um, intervention to get her to complete the test and get that order. Okay. Um, so just so I'm following the timeline, first test, what you couldn't get a read from that. You asked for a second one on the 15th and the 24th. And on the on March 2nd, did she she advised you that her attorney said not to complete the test? Is that accurate? Yes. And later that day on the second, she followed back up and said she would do it. So I resent the paperwork for March 3rd. OK, so you re-referred her for, I guess, now the third or fourth time on March 3rd. Yes. Did Miss Acharte uh, complete the hair follicle testing that you requested of her on March 3rd, 2022? No. She informed me the next day that she took her attorney's advice again and decided not to complete the test. Okay. Um, did she indicate that she had done anything to her appearance after? Yes. Okay. What did she tell you about that? She told me that she dyed her hair after the first test that we sent her for, and she was worried about her results being affected since she dyed her hair. Um, did you indicate to her that since she did that, you wouldn't be testing or something else? No, we informed her that we would still be sending her to complete the test. Okay. Um, while you had the case, did Mrs. Charte complete uh, any hair follicle testing for you? Yes, she decided to go um, March 18th um, before our court ordered the case. Okay. March 18th, 2022? Yes. Okay. And were there any other services that Mrs. Charte engaged in while she was part of your family-based case? So we told her that based off of the results from the hair follicle, that would determine the next steps for services um, because that would help prove whether her story was accurate, if she's been negative from meth the last three months. Um, but we did discuss an OSAR assessment, therapy with the individual therapist and ongoing drug tests. Did she indicate a willingness to cooperate in those services? She was willing but hesitant at the same time because she just finished all of her services with CPS in 2018. And she said that the allegations were hearsay, so she didn't feel like it was necessary for us to be involved. But she was willing to work with me. Um, did Ms. Acharte talk to you about her previous involvement with the department? Not really. OK. Just that there had been previous involvement? or something? Yeah, and, and the steps she took as far as like accountability court and the services she engaged in after that, um, her behavioral changes, like I mentioned earlier, getting a job, uh, maintaining the house, having a good rapport with the children. Okay. And during your involvement with her, what was her, if, if she provided you anything, what was her story regarding her drug use, if any? At that time, um, she just informed me that she was sober. Um, her issue was alcohol. That's what everybody would say, that no one had concerns for actual drug use. Um, that, that would really be it. And she was just, she was really adamant that she was not abusing drugs. Okay. And, and I'm sorry, I just want to be clear. You said something about a case in 2018 that Ms. Acharte discussed with you? She discussed the steps she took, but not the case exactly. Just the behavioral changes she made after that case. Okay, well, what behavioral changes did she indicate she had made? That she's been sober for, you know, those two years. Um, that she is working full time, that she was able to get a house for her and the kids and move them all in, um, that the kids are in school and they're doing the things that they need to do. She expressed that um, she got into the programs and she met people who were willing to help her get set up with the house uh, and that she completed her accountability court. Okay, and you're under for the record, I'd note that uh, the respondent mother, Marissa Charte, has left 
appears to have left the courtroom, but left the camera running. Yes. Okay. Um, and at this time, Your Honor, the department would like to, well, I'd, I'd move to offer and admit petitioners exhibits one, two, three, four, five, and six, just for expediency sake. Those have been shared with, I've shared them with Mr. Poplinski and Ms. Smith this morning, as well as um, they have been on file for quite some time. They are drug test results. I can share screen now uh, just to show those. I did not share them with Mr. Hardy or Mr. Cormack because I did not believe they participate in today's uh, hearing. But and, and as to one through six, all being drug screens, do they all have a chain of custody and do they all have uh, the file stamp on it? Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, I haven't checked my emails this morning. I, I didn't, I mean, I, I don't know when she shared them. I'm presuming it was sometime this morning. I haven't seen them. I am familiar with a number of drug trusts with the requisite uh, business record affidavit and the file stamps and all that. If we could just, I mean, identify for the record what one, what exactly, who's is what? Petition is okay. one is this, petition two is that. That would be helpful. Can you check your email, Mr. Kaplinski? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And, and while you're doing that, I'm going to let Mr. Rushford in. I've already warned him once that driving is dangerous. He can't be driving while he's trying to hold, while we're trying to observe court. And then he came back in. I let him in and he continued to drive. And I told him, stop driving. It's dangerous. And he turned his camera off. So I wouldn't see that he was driving. So I kicked him out a second time. Now he's back a third time. That's all for the record, Sandra. And, and while he, uh, Mr. Poplinski, checked his email, would you like me to identify those documents? For Let him pull them up first. Hey, thank Mr. you, Judge. Mr. Rushford, I see that you're no longer driving. Thank you. Correct. I had no service where I was at. It was hard to hear you guys. Thank you. Ms. Smith? Your Honor, I've reviewed all of them, and I have no objections. And I don't think they apply to Mr. McCormick, uh, Mr. Hardy, or Mr. Baker, correct? Uh, not for purposes of the hearing today. Okay, uh, they will be admitted. Okay. And it says Linux has entered the, the room. How would Linux be able to enter the meeting? I'm sorry, Your Honor, this is Robin Heineman. I'm trying to switch over to my phone, and of course that shows the school's Zoom okay. link. It's so not Linux, it's, it's myself. Okay, I'll admit you. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Okay, go ahead, Ms. House. Okay. And again, for the record, we've, we've lost the mother. She's no longer in the hearing. All right. Hang on just a second. Let's see if she'll come back. Okay. I don't know that she uh, may be just having some connection issues. Let's see if it shows. Ms. House, you can proceed. Oh, okay. Thank you, Aaron. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Cardwell, I'm going to go ahead and share with you what's been previously marked as petitioners four. Are you able to see petitioners exhibit four? Yes. And I'm going to scroll to page 34. I'm sorry, I'll start with 31. All right. And are you able to see on page 31 of petitioners four, a special specimen from Marissa Charte collected on February 1st, 2022, a urine sample? Yes. Is this a test you sent her for? Yes. Okay. And just for the record, could you please read what the results of that test were? Um, she was positive for infinity. Okay. And then we're going to go to page 34. And are you able to see a hair follicle specimen collected February 8, 2022 from Marissa Charte? Yes. Okay. And on this page, we see that the test was canceled. Yes. Is this the test you were referring to that uh, was, had a fatal flaw, the specimen mismatch? Yes. And so from this test, you then asked for the subsequent one? Yes. And you indicated earlier she completed a test for you on March 18th? Yes. How did that come about? Because it was because I thought you sent her on March uh, 3rd or 4th. Right, I did. When I sent her on March 3rd, um, that's when she agreed she would do it. And then she followed up when I asked her, hey, did you complete the test? She let me know that she decided to take the advice of her attorney on March 4th and not complete the test. Um, she ended up agreeing later on, let me know that she would go and complete the test. So then I sent it again for March 18th. Between March 4th and March 18th, what conversations were you having with Mrs. Charte to try and get her to engage in this testing? It was more just in reminding her of the steps I have to take because she's not willing to submit to the test. So just let her know I'll have a day for her um, whenever I meet with my attorneys and give her the court dates for the court order um, case to get her to the order to complete the drug test. Okay. She realized that she had the order, so she said I might as well just do the test before we even made it to court. And before you took the test, was she given another opportunity to, to talk about any drugs she might be using? Yes. And what did she say about that? She continued to deny um, outside of her bypass, which was prescribed by her. Okay. Excuse me, I'm going to go to page 37 of petitioner's score. And petitioner's uh, page 37, you see a hair follicle test collected 31822 uh, from Marissa Charte? Yes. Okay. And for the record, what were, what were the results of this hair follicle specimen test? She was positive for amphetamine and methamphetamine. Okay. Um, when you got this positive test for methamphetamine, did you talk to Mrs. Charte about this? Excuse me. Yes. Um, I let her know that at that time we'll be filing when the results came back, um, which the results returned on March 31st is when they were available. Um, that's when I let her know she was positive for meth. She still denied it at that point. Um, and I let her know that we will be presenting the case as a removal. Okay. Um, so you said she continued to deny methamphetamine use? Yes, at that point. Did she come up with another story later on for her drug test result? Yes. What was that? So on April 7th, um, she sent me a, a long message 
let me know that she received a call from a friend, someone that she was buying her Vyvanse from off the street. Um, her friend let her know that the Vyvanse was being filled with meth. She told me that she couldn't get her prescription in March because she, she missed her appointment due to moving into the new home that she was able to get. Um, she told me that she was buying the pills off the street because she didn't want to wait until her appointment on April 28th with Dr. James. She said that she didn't realize it was meth because the only difference between meth and Vyvanse is it keeps you awake. Um, she told me she had a total of 18 pills and that she took her last one April 6th. I told her um, that it sounds like she's being dishonest this whole time and that she is abusing meth. Um, and then I informed her, even if it is true that she bought the Vyvanse off the street and was not aware of it being filled with meth, um, she was still doing something illegal by buying pills off the street and were already involved because she was pulled over with meth in her car. Um, and just to be clear, was Mrs. Charte living with her children at the time? Yes. That, invest them, excuse me. So she was living with them at the time that we're talking about during your family-based case. Yes. In the beginning, th there was the safety plan um, when her UA came back negative and we were able to verify well, when it came back positive for amphetamine, and we were able to verify her prescription with the doctor for Vyvanse. The safety plan was lifted at that point. Um, I was out of town, so I can't really attest to that um, to that decision too much, but um, it was lifted and she was given a chance to take the kids home with her while we waited for the hair follicle results because she was not actively using meth at that time based off of the UA. Okay, and prior to the safety plan? Or prior to the safety plan, the children were with maternal grandmother. And did mother have access to? She had to be supervised. She could not live in the home. Okay, I, I think I've asked a bad question. So you put a family a safety plan in place at some point prior to you actually putting in that safety plan, who were the children living with? So that was during the investigation. So the children were with mom primarily. And then the investigator put in the safety plan and the case was transferred to me with a safety plan in place. Okay. And did you as part, when you got mom's hair follicle test back, did you then turn around and test the children? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been previously marked and admitted as petitioner's exhibit one. I'm going to go to page four. And we see here a participant donor, Noxa Charte Laughlin. Who is Noxa Charte Laughlin? Her son, okay. Mr. Charte's son. And how old was Knox when you first got involved in this case? I believe, let me see. I was going to say nine, but I want to be sure. He was 10, I believe. He was 10? Okay. Yes. All right. And this is a hair follicle specimen collected from him on April 4th, 2022. Is that accurate? Yes. And what did his hair follicle test indicate? Um, that he was positive for amphetamine. Okay. And go to petitioners two, page four. All right. And here we see a participant or donor, Len Acharte Rushford. You know who that is? Yes, that's her daughter. Okay. And is her full name Lennox? Yes, her full name is Lennox. How old was Lennox? How she old was Lennox at the four time? or five. She was four and getting ready to turn five, I believe. And this is a hair follicle specimen collected April 4th, 2022? Yes. And what did her hair follicle specimen indicate? She was positive for methamphetamine. And amphetamines, is that correct? Yes. And then petitioners three, page four. We see a participant in our Memph Acharte Rushford. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, who is Memph? That is her, her other daughter. And what's her full name? Memphis Acharte okay. Rushford. And this is a hair follicle specimen collected on April 4th, 2022? Yes. Is this a test you sent these, the children or child for? Yes. And the one petitioner two that said Len, is that also the test you sent Lennox for? Yes. And on petitioners three, what is the result of this test? She was positive for amphetamines and methamphetamine. Okay, and I don't believe I asked you, how old was Memphis at the time? She was two. All right. Um, when you started getting back these drug tests and mom and children are positive for amphetamines and methamphetamines, did this cause you any concern? Yes. Uh, did you feel after getting these that mother had been being truthful with you throughout your involvement with her? No, it confirmed that she was being dishonest the whole time. Okay. And once you got back the positive drug tests for mom and the children, what was the next step? Well, we filed for the um, removal on the 31st. So the children were already placed with grandmother. We had already started the process of conservator conservatorship. Um, so the next step was waiting for the hearing, um, ensuring that, you know, the safety plan was put back in place until we can get things ordered. And you said you filed for the removal on um, when, what date? I'm sorry. The 31st, March 31st. Okay. Yeah. After you did that, you've gotten these drug tests. Uh, did you have any further interactions or involvement with Mrs. Charte? 
yes, um, I had to do the follow-up visit the next day that we're required to do after removal is granted. Um, I met with Mia. Um, that's when she let me know that she would be positive on her test. Um, I met with maternal excuse, grandmother. Excuse me, let me ask you to be, clarify that last statement. You okay. met with Mia and that's when she said she would be positive on her test. She who said she would be positive on her test. Mia said she Mia told positive you. on her own hair follicle. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Okay, and to be, to be clear, how old is Mia? At that time she was 17. Is she another of uh, Miss Asharte's children? Yes. Okay. Um, so you did your follow-up visit. You met with Mia. Did you meet again with Miss Asharte? Yes, I met with Miss Asharte as well. Um, I met with them both that that following day. Um, and after that, we just stayed in contact until the seventh. And on April seventh is when Miss Asharte sent me the message admitting um, to everything. What do you mean admitting to everything? As far as um, being why she was positive for meth, her friend filling the capsules with Vyvanse, I mean, with meth instead of the Vyvanse. Did she, okay. And then after April 7th, any further involvement? No, we, we had the um, hearing. And after that, I, I was no longer involved in the case. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Cardwell. I have no further questions for this witness at this time, Your Honor. Okay, folks, we're going to take about a five minute break. We're going to work until 1230, Sandra, if that works for you. Okay, good. Okay, so let's take a five minute break, folks. Bye. <laughs>